Welcome to this lesson on evaluating water surfaces and open channels that experience either a contraction or expansion. After completing this video, you'll be able to apply the specific energy equation to evaluate water surface profiles within a contraction and expansion and determine the maximum contraction within a channel based on the maximum unit discharge. Prior to evaluating the hydraulics associated with expansions and contractions, the following statements are essential. The channel width changes through the expansion and contraction. The flow rate remains constant through the, expansion, through the expansion and contraction. However, the unit discharge, which is defined as the flow rate divided by the base width, changes. And in a contraction, the unit discharge will increase downstream, while in an expansion, it will decrease in the downstream direction. And finally, the specific energy through an expansion and contraction remains constant. The following schematic shows specific energy diagram. As the unit discharge increases, you will have a new specific energy line for a specific unit discharge. If the unit discharge if the energy is to remain constant, as stated above, then the unit discharge must change, resulting in a change in flow depth, for example, from dy to dx, or from dx to dy, depending on whether we are dealing with an expansion or a contraction. A contraction within a channel will occur at a bridge. The plan view provided shows that as the flow moves from point A to point B, there is a contraction within the channel, which reduces the base width. A specific energy diagram shows that the depth of flow at point A and point B, based on the fact that the specific energy is constant through the contraction. The unit discharge at A is shown on the specific diagram with the black line, while the unit discharge at point B is shown on the specific diagram as a purple line and it shows that the depth at A will decrease to the depth at B as the flow moves through the channel. Thus, this shows that the flow is subcritical and the depth will decrease through the contraction, moving from point A to point B. Remember that the flow rate is constant, but the unit discharge increased through the contraction, which results in a decrease in the depth. On the other hand, for a supercritical channel, the flow depth will increase through the contraction. This is quite rare, and usually you will not see a contraction in a supercritical channel. Since the specific energy diagram or specific energy itself is constant, a graph can be depicted that shows depth versus unit discharge. The solid line represents the constant specific energy. At a given unit discharge, the flow depth can be determined. The maximum unit discharge will occur at critical depth, and flow depths greater than critical depth will be subcritical, while those less than critical depth will be supercritical. An expansion within an open channel occurs when you want to widen a channel. The plan view shows that as flows move from point A through point B within a contraction, there is an increase in width and a decrease in unit discharge. Just like a contraction, the specific energy from point A to point B is constant. A specific energy diagram is shown with depths at point A and B based on the specific energy that's constant through the expansion. The unit discharge at point A is shown with the purple line, while the unit discharge for point B A specific energy diagram is provided to show what the depth of flow is at point A and B based on the specific energy in the based on A specific energy diagram is provided to show what the depth of flow is at point A and B based on the fact that specific energy is constant through the expansion. The unit discharge at A is shown on the specific energy diagram as a purple line while the unit discharge at B is shown on the specific diagram as a black line. Since we're going through an expansion, the depth 
will increase as you're moving from point A to point B in subcritical channels. As shown, the subcritical channel, the depth will increase and the depth will move from point A to point B. One needs to be very mindful of potential flooding. On the other hand, for a supercritical channel, the flow depth will decrease through the channel. Let's do a couple of examples to help illustrate this concept. You're given a rectangular cross section through a relatively horizontal channel. channel. A contraction occurs at a bridge downstream. The measured flow rate is 500 CFS, the upstream channel width is 10 feet, and the depth of flow is 6 feet. What is the maximum possible contraction? The first step we need to do is determine the energy at the upstream section. The energy is the depth, 6 feet, plus the velocity squared, which is 500 divided by the area, 10 times 60 squared, all divided by 2 times 32.2, which is the gravity. And that gives us the energy, a specific energy, of 7.08. Next, we need to determine what is going on at point 2. Remember, a maximum contraction will occur at minimum energy. Therefore, we know minimum energy occurs at critical depth. A simplification for critical depth is provided for rectangular channels. The critical depth is the cube root of the flow rate squared divided by the base width squared times gravity. The minimum energy is determined to be 3 halves. E1 is equal to EC, which is E2 and we get a critical depth of 4.72. We further can go on and determine that the base width is equal to the square root of the flow rate squared divided by the critical depth cubed times gravity, which tells us 500 squared divided by 4.72 cubed times 32.2 gives us a base width of 8.59 feet. Therefore, the maximum possible contraction is going from a 10-foot channel to an 8.59-foot channel. The next example tells you you're still given the same rectangular channel with a flow rate of 500 CFS. The channel experiences a contraction from 10 feet to 5 feet. We want to determine the flow depth. Now remember, the flow depth at point 2 has to be critical. This will allow for the greatest possible contraction. So the first step is to find critical depth based on the simplification we just introduced. So critical depth is equal to the cube root of the flow rate, 500 squared, divided by 5 squared, because that's the width at point 2, times 32.2. That gives us a critical depth of 6.77 feet. Next, the energy at point 2 is 3 halves times 6.77, which is 10.2 feet. We set 10.2 feet equal to the depth at point one plus the velocity squared, which is the flow rate squared divided by 10 times the depth squared divided by two times 32.2. We, we can further analyze this by rearranging the equation and using goal seek and we will get two flow depths. D1 is 9.8 or 2.2. Remember, we really want to have a subcritical channel as you're going through a contraction. And therefore, for subcritical to be true, we're going to have a 9.8 feet depth at point one. So now at, at point two, we have a depth of 6.77. And at point one, we have 9.8 feet. I hope these examples help you see the importance of specific energy, critical depth, minimum energy within the understanding of expansions and contractions.